the elders of the church. Friends, our first scripture reading comes to us from Matthew's Gospel, the middle of the crucifixion scene, chapter 27, verses 45 through 54. Before we hear these, let us pray. Almighty God, we pray that you would once again speak to us your holy word that is ever living and ever present. Open our ears, open our hearts, that we may once again encounter the risen Christ, who is the Lord, as we hear the Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Beginning in verse 45. <clears throat> From noon on, darkness came over the land until three o'clock in the afternoon. Remember, we're right in the middle of the crucifixion. And at about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemme sabachthani. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when some of the bystanders heard it, they said, well, this man is calling for Elijah. And at once, one of them ran and got a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait. Let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. <laughs> and at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And after his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion, those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and, earthquake and what took place, he was terrified and said, Truly, this man was God's son. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, Good Friday. Let's go to Easter. The 28th chapter of Matthew, verses 1 through 10. Listen again for God's word. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord, descending down from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He's not here. For he has been raised, as he said, Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead. And indeed, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Sisters and brothers, this too is the <coughs> word of the Lord, the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I, I need to con confess this up front. I had tears in my eyes when I was writing this outline. Um, so if I cry today, forgive me, but I believe this gospel message has the power to change your life because it has changed mine. Um, so forgive me if I cry, let's see where the Spirit leads us. And normally I'm an extemporaneous preacher, but I'm like typing my outline and the words are just flowing, and somehow I ended up with a text manuscript. Uh, so bear with me today. You know, I begin with a small story. Far out in the vastness of the ocean, 
There's a school of fish swimming around in the beautiful particularities of overwhelming depth and goodness in the beauty of the sea. Two younger fish are swimming around when an older, wiser fish comes swimming by and asks, How's the water, fellas? <laughs> the younger fish swim on, pondering these puzzling words when one of these two looks at the other and finally asks, What in the world is water? <laughs> <coughs> Friends, on this Easter Sunday, it is my great privilege to share the good news of Jesus Christ with you. Friends, because of God's graciousness revealed in this Easter act of Jesus Christ, in his death and in his resurrection, friends, we are literally swimming around in love and beauty and grace. And when we realize this fact, we possess the ability to swim with the overwhelming current of God's love, or we can continue on believing that our own brute strength will somehow overcome God's current, and we declare this ocean to be something other than love or grace. Friends, this is good news. In fact, to folks who have yet to fully realize this ocean of love in which we live, recognizing this has the capacity to save their soul from the darkness that continues to somehow throw shadows at us in this world and in our personal lives. And so often we are like these younger fish, right? We live our lives not recognizing the beauty of the fact that God's love wins. Instead, we focus on the seaweed. We focus on the fact that life just doesn't seem to be going according to my agenda. Or, more poignantly, we observe situations like the Easter bombings in Sri Lanka, killing over 200 people, many of whom were in an Easter worship just like this. And in hotels, in the most sacred of our Christian holidays, we can get lost in this, right? We see the garbage of life polluting our waters, and it's so easy to focus our lives on things that may be important, but in real actuality are subordinate to the realities of Christ's love surrounding and overwhelming us. And did you know that clergy are very susceptible to this, too? There's this terrific comic strip produced by Radio Free Babylon uh, that I want to show you today. Uh, it's terrific. It, it has like my twin brother uh, up here today. <laughs> Christianity is under attack and the world's going to hell and the Presbyterians can't even get to church on time, Jesus. Good morning, sunshine, replies our Lord. This better not be the theme of your Easter sermon. <laughs> of course not, Jesus. I'll do something on light overcoming the darkness, uh, triumph over the death, etc. You know, all that usual Easter stuff. And Jesus replies, good, but do me a favor. Give this into your heart before it comes out of your mouth. You know, we think a lot about the world in which we live, but how often do we default? to the world's going to hell, forgetting the actual reality that in Christ, love wins. Indeed, life does overcome the darkness. Life overcomes death. This beautiful and dazzling and amazing grace of God, it wins every time over bombings and over war. It wins over cancer. It wins over broken relationship. And friends, this is the reality of the world in which we live. Let me tell you about this from a biblical perspective, but before we do so, I want you to consider a few major events in your own life that have profoundly shaped your life. Maybe it's positive, maybe it's negative, but as you think about these things, this is, can be good fodder for your conversation around the Easter table today. What are those 
moments that have profoundly shaped your life. Maybe it's marriage, or high school, or college, graduation. Maybe it's falling in love, or having children, or maybe it's something negative, right? The reality of death in our world. Or maybe it's the fact that you'd like to get married, but have not yet found that person. Or maybe it's a painful divorce or sickness. Whatever these moments are that have profoundly shaped you, I can guarantee that these have revolved around people, whether it's someone else or yourself. Friends, God created us to be relational creatures because God is relational, right? God exists as three in one. In fact, God is relationship, Father, Spirit, Son, you know, for me in my life, I can name my marriage, the birth of my two children. During these moments, we experience the heights and the depths of life that makes us fully human. We experience the emotional ecstasy, erotic or platonic love, and we live in moments where we realize how deep this essence of love is. And for a moment, sometimes we remember that love is the only reality that is or ever was, or ever will be. And again, in our sadness, we're reminded of this love where we experience the deepest of human pain. These pivotal moments shape our lives, and they all point us towards the reality of our lives lived in relationship to God and to each other. It goes back to Jesus' teaching, right? Someone asks, what's the greatest commandment, Jesus, in a nutshell? And what does he say? Love God, love your neighbor. On this is the whole Bible. Love. Friends, the reality of the world is love. And the waters in which we swim is love, and it is inherently good. Not because I said so, but because God said so in the book of Genesis. Jesus' disciples were experiencing a valley that had profoundly shaped their life as we come to the Easter sermon today. They had come to love their friend, their brother Jesus. And even if they didn't fully comprehend what Jesus was doing, they had unknowingly gazed deeply into the eyes of God in the road, and their spirits were warmed by the depths of his divine love. And as we all experience the search for truth and meaning, for a while, the disciples' hearts, this ache of truth and meaning, their hearts were satisfied because they were with capital T, truth. They were with capital L, love, Jesus. And as we come to our scriptures today, on Good Friday, all of their hopes, their passions, their dreams, their love was brutally executed on the cross. Jesus was unjustly arrested by the state after experiencing betrayal, not just from one of those people, but from one of their own. Friends, this hurts. I don't know how much worse it gets in our hearts. When Jesus was dead, <coughs> buried, gone. And while different, of course, we too have these feelings of the disciples who were gathered there that day. When your world is turned upside down and you're left in a state of emotional shock, where the best you can do is let your autonomic nervous system take over so that at least your body can breathe. Maybe it's the realization that still Christians and people of other faiths continue to persecute and be persecuted and terrorized around the world. Maybe it's the sudden death of a loved one, or you go through a terrible divorce, or maybe it happens when you're working with your therapist as you unravel the years of child abuse. And friends, if you're lucky, your body will bathe and baptize your face with tears as you make the same statement of Jesus in Matthew's gospel. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
And as we speak of the lowness of our human experience that our God takes on, it's remarkable that even as Jesus is wondering where in the world God is, these moments in Matthew are still not his last breath before his death. Instead, Matthew tells us that it's a loud cry with no translatable words, but a shriek shrouded in the fullness of the moment. Maybe it's the pain, maybe it's the realization that death is a few breaths away. Maybe the scream is completion, the what if. What if is a desperate cry of hope. I can only try to guess the emotion of Jesus' cry, but in the last cry of Jesus, we find ourselves in, in our own experiences our loud cries to a God that can feel so far away. Now forgive me for beleaguering this painful point, but this is a significant day in the lives of the disciples gathered at the crucifixion, and it serves to set the stage for what becomes the gospel, not just for me and you, but for the entire cosmos. The death of their friend was one of those significant moments that profoundly shaped the lives of those disciples. Christ is beginning to reveal a world that acknowledges that people do have the capacity to swim against the current of God's love and bring heartache to the other fish in the schools in which we swim, or, or it's beginning to reveal that how we can swim with God's current of love that in the end only takes us back to God's grace. You may be thinking, it's getting hot in here, so feel free to open the door. <laughs> Preachers are full of hot air, right? <laughs> We're ready for resurrection, preacher. But the next few passages of Matthew after Jesus dies, are vital to understanding how God is revealing himself through this pivotal point in the history of the universe as we know it. It's in sickness or death, or when we feel so far away from God, that God shows the reality of the world, the reality of the ocean in which we swim. In the valley of the shadow of death, God is fulfilling the promises of the Old Testament, showing us that the promise has always been oneness with God. We don't have time to go in depth here, but look at these passages up. These just came to my head as I was writing this sermon. The Old Testament is pointing to this day. Friends, the world is inherently good, and God's going to bring it back into himself. God's plan has always been to bring this universe back into itself, and Paul summarizes this succinctly in Colossians. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him, all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Jesus is the head of the body. The church. He is the beginning. He is the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him, I made this read, listen up, folks, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And all of this prophecy. Is coming to fruition on this day of the Lord. Friends, I believe that this is the day of the Lord that all the Old Testament was speaking of. It's the weekend that we celebrate today, the death and resurrection of Jesus. So let's read this pivotal passage in Matthew as he is telling us what God is doing in the death of God. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. Tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. A little crazy, don't you think? After his resurrection, death, after his resurrection, they came out of the tombs, 
and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion, the Roman soldier, and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, truly, this man was God's son. Now friends, Matthew is less concerned about historical, factual specificity than he is about sharing the mystical, overwhelming love of God in this passage to show us that something beautiful and true is happening here. And I want to point this out. This is the good news of Jesus' death, right? It mentions that the curtain is torn in two. This is the curtain in the temple. This is the curtain where only one person per year, the high priest, would enter into the Holy of Holies. This is the place where God dwelt, and no one dared go enter there because you're not worthy. <coughs> But in the death and resurrection of Jesus, Matthew is telling that this curtain is split in two. This is good news. God is freely accessible to all mankind around the world. This is good news. Matthew says that the rocks are being split into two. Language that says the bedrock of religious perspective is forever being changed, just being broken apart. No longer is getting into heaven about your good works. Friends, experiencing the kingdom of God is fulfilling what God has promised all along, that this world is good and God's going to bring you back into it, whether you like it or not. Perspectives of religion are changing. The earth is shaking, says Matthew. This is vital. This is pivotal, telling us that something new is happening here. The dead are being raised. Did anyone ever notice this in the gospel before? Matthew is using mystical language to share that new life is springing up all around in the, in the death and resurrection of Jesus. And the centurion is this incredibly symbolic figure, picture in the gospel. The centurion represents Rome, government, powers of the world. And when the powers of the world say truly, this man is the son of God. This is pivotal here. Any good Roman citizen knew that the only son of God is Augustus. Caesar. But the powers of the world are declaring that Jesus is Lord. Friends, this is incredibly good news, what Jesus is doing here. This is a significant event, not just for the disciples, but for me and you. It shapes the reality, this ocean in which we swim, in which we live. God is revealing that there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God, neither death nor life. Friends, God is coming after you to show you how to experience true freedom in our image as the children of God. Today we experience the promise of that resurrection. Rising again in victory, declaring that the powers of the world will never have their way because God's intention has always been for me and you to be in full relationship with God and to experience the goodness and the beauty of the realization that when we live, we are doing nothing but swimming in the overwhelming grace, beauty, and truth of God's love. Friends, these waters can't be stopped. How often are you swimming against it? When was the last time you enjoyed swimming with your whole self in these waters of grace? You know, before the disciples went to the tomb, they were at one of their lowest points of their life. Mary goes to the grave. And at this grave, she experiences one of her high points in life because there's a messenger from God who declares to, to her, declares to you, do not be afraid. Go and tell the others good news. And when Jesus shows up, he says, greetings. Here I am. Share this good news. I'm going to be with you until the end of the age. And going back to our swimming analogy, is Jesus not showing up all around us? Is Jesus not in the rebirth and beauty of the vegetation that springs forth outside? Is Jesus not in the beauty of the sunrise we experienced this morning? Is Jesus not in the love of your family and friends? 
Friends, Jesus is everywhere. If we would only open our eyes to see and let this truth live in our hearts, wouldn't our lives be changed? And I want to make this point because it's funny how people in Christianity, maybe even you, maybe, maybe even me, how quick we are sometimes to turn this good news, the gospel, back into the law when Christians say, well, God loves you, but you've got to do X, Y, and Z. You've got to believe A, B, and C. Otherwise, you're going to hell. You know anyone like that? How is that good news? Not in the sense of, you know, wanting to go to heaven, but it does exactly what Jesus came to abolish. Friends, a gospel like that is not gospel. It's law where you have to earn your way into the kingdom. The Reformed tradition has always said you didn't do anything to deserve God's grace. God loves you because that's who God is, not for anything he did or didn't do. Friends, that's good news. And friends, we are swimming in this grace, and how often do we focus on that garbage? that comes along in the waters in which we swim. How do we see the grace? How do we learn to open our eyes and swim in this beauty? There are practices, not to save our souls, Jesus has already done this, but there are practices that can help us open our eyes and live as fish who go along with the waters of Christ. And I, wrap them up in our mission statement uh, that we have here at Covenant. The first is this, we open ourselves up to experience God's covenant love. And this covenant love that I talk about is not CPC's covenant love, it's God's covenant love. We experience it, we, we come to worship, we engage in prayer in our lives, we gaze at the beauty of the natural world where Jesus is as well, we soak up the love of our family and our friends, and we allow ourselves to experience it. One way to open our eyes to swim in the sea of grace. Another is to take a step and nurture this covenant love. To come to understand the reality of the sweet sea. Take a class here at Covenant. Go to a Bible study. Be part of a small group. Commit yourselves to personal devotions at home. Come to one of our many fellowship opportunities. Not even just here, but at any church, right? Nurture this. And the last thing is maybe your commitment to opening your eyes to seeing the sea of grace is to share this covenant love. That it's seemingly scandalous, right? That God loves you just as you are, all of you saints, and especially all of you sinners here. And for all of us, God loves us so much that he refuses to leave us as you are today. We grow deeper by sharing this really good news. But I only have a page left. <laughs> but sharing this is really important, right? Like, this is scandalous news. God loves you. We're, sitting, we're swimming in a sea of grace. Who says that these days, right? Jesus does. Um, but our mission committee is gathering on May 5th to put together a strategic plan of how do we encourage Chrissy and Barb and Brian to share this good news. How do we do that? So if you're interested in sharing good news, May 5th after church, uh, head back to the van quick room. But friends, let us be reminded of this pivotal moment in history today. We have been given this great gift of realizing that we are swimming in nothing but grace and love. So I close with a quote from Frederick Peter. This grace that we swim in means something like this. Here is your life. You might never have been, but you are, because the party of the world wouldn't be complete without you. And now he takes on the voice of God. Here is the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Do not be afraid. I am with you. Nothing can ever separate us. It's for you that I created the universe. I love you. There's only one catch. 
like any other gift, but the gift of grace can be yours only if you will reach out and take it. So I ask you, friends, will you reach out and take this gift from God, realizing that everything is grace? As you swim along today and every day, my brother Jesus comes along and asks you, how's the water? May you know the grace that everything is love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us pray. Lord, forgive long-winded preachers, but thank you for such good news. Oh, wow. Your grace overwhelms us. Lord, help us to open our eyes that we might see that we are swimming in your love. Help us to practice that, we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.